I encourage you to uh, be praying for um, the Moran family. Um, Mr. Moran was the principal at Hart High School and uh, uh, passed away very suddenly yesterday while he was uh, out on a run. 33 years old, uh, leaves a wife and two small kids. But uh, thankfully, thankfully, a uh, very strong Christian family. Um, the Lord will get them through it, but boy, it's going to be hard. And uh, for the heart community as well. And uh, he was the principal at Montague uh, briefly um, before he went up to Hart. And uh, boy, he's doing such a wonderful job at Hart. Yep. 33. 46? 47? Okay. Well, I saw 33, so okay. Either way, it's still young. 47, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Not much difference, but uh, yeah. Mm. Tough. We are in chapter 5 of First Peter, getting close to bringing this to a close. Uh, this is um, this is a section. These four verses are a section that kind of um, stands out by itself a little bit with regards to the whole flow of First Peter. And of course, um, this is talking primarily about pastors and uh, and uh, leaders, pastors and elders. Charles Haddon Spurgeon um, was an incredible man. If you were going to uh, put together a top ten list of uh, preachers throughout the history of the church, he would be in that uh, in that list, of course. Um, he had. Uh, uh, an unbelievable mastery of the English language and uh, the ability to uh, deliver. They didn't have microphones back in those days. And uh, he built his church. Uh, he, he started out um, he started out in a, in a little place um, at the age of 20, uh, he was called to New Park Street Baptist Chapel in London. And uh, it was not uncommon for him to have uh, as many as 6,000 people in church on a Sunday morning. And um, then they ended up um, building... Uh, a bigger place because they needed more space um, because people were waiting for hours out in the snow in the dead of winter waiting for the doors to open so they could get a seat uh, to hear Spurgeon preach and he ended up uh, building what was known then uh, renamed the Metropolitan Tabernacle and uh, uh, the swelling of the membership uh, finally reached 14,500 people in, in that church. Um, and although he was a Baptist, 
uh, Spurgeon was an evangelical Calvinist. And uh, boy, oh boy. He hand wrote uh, up to 80 letters a day. They couldn't have been very long letters, but he hand wrote up to 80 letters a day. Uh, he usually would preach twice a day somewhere. He, uh, he founded um, a college. He founded a number of orphanages, uh, schools of one sort, societies of another sort, missionary societies. Um, and I believe he was 59 when he died. Uh, he just completely wore himself out. Completely wore himself out. But despite all of those wonderful things that uh, Spurgeon was able to do, he was known as the Prince of Preachers. And uh, if I was to compile a bucket list, one of the things on my bucket list would be to go to London and to stand at Spurgeon's grave and just give thanks to the Lord. Um, but uh, uh, he, he also um, brought upon himself a tremendous level of criticism. You've got to figure with all that stuff going on in a group that size, there's going to be a few critics. And um, he he seemed to thrive in the midst of criticism. Uh, two things that he was criticized for in his personal life. Uh, number one, he loved cigars. Spurgeon smoked cigars. And uh, he was criticized uh, for that. And... Uh, I remember reading one time when uh, D.L. Moody came across the pond uh, to speak, and uh, he spoke about the evils of smoking, um, not knowing <laughs> that Spurgeon smoked cigars. But everybody else knew, and there was this murmur that went along. And uh, when it was all said and done, he thanked him for his message and uh, he assured him that he would only smoke his cigars to the glory of God. <laughs> the other thing that Spurgeon was criticized for, he and his wife, and that was uh, uh, the home that they had, which they purchased with their own funds, a uh, home and a large tract of land. And it was a large home. Uh, and... Uh, a, a, there was, a, there was a lot of pressure uh, in Victorian England for you. If you're going to be uh, a pastor or a minister, uh, you needed to uh, look the part. You needed to be poor and uh, all this type of thing. Um, but uh, he never let any of that bother him. And uh, he was unmoved uh, by the pressure that he had to endure. Um, he wrote a book um, that uh, uh, is, he wrote so many things, so many things, my goodness. All of his sermons have been published, and uh, just recently they came out with a whole brand new set of sermons that they have found uh, by Spurgeon that are in the process of being uh, published. Uh, but uh, he wrote a book called Lectures to My Students, and uh, he, he, he spoke primarily to um, young men who were preparing for ministry. And uh, in this he said, Every workman knows the necessity of keeping his tools in a good state of repair. If the workman lose the edge, he knows that there will be a greater draught upon his energies or his work will be badly done. It will be in vain for me to stock my library or organize societies or project schemes 
if I neglect the culture of myself. For books and agencies and systems are only remotely the instruments of my holy calling. My own spirit, soul, and body are my nearest machinery for sacred service. My spiritual faculties and my inner life are my battle axe and weapons for war. You must remember that you are God's sword, his instrument. I trust a, holy, uh, a chosen vessel unto him to bear his name. In great measure, according to the purity and perfection of the instrument, will be the success. It is not great talent God blesses, so much as likeness to Jesus. And then he quotes Robert Murray McShane, and he says, A holy minister is an awful weapon in the hand of God. Um, powerful stuff. Now, we cannot, uh, we cannot be a bunch of little Spurgeons. There was only one, and that was enough. Um, but boy, oh boy, um, the things that he stood for and uh, exemplified uh, still speak today, though he being dead speaketh. <laughs> uh, and Peter uh, brings these things to uh, the forefront uh, in verse 1 of chapter 5. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. <laughs> there are some practical things that we need to remember um, as leaders in a church, and in particular those who are elders and pastors. So I may be preaching to myself here, um, but uh, at least you'll know what to look for. Um, one of the secrets of a long-term pastorate is clear-thinking realism. Clear-thinking realism on the part of the pastor and on the part of the congregation. Um, most churches will not be anything like the Metropolitan Tabernacle. Uh, and, and, and none of us that are in ministry today will ever be uh, a Spurgeon. Um, I would soon say that if Spurgeon were to apply for a pastoral position today, nobody would hire him. Nobody would hire him. Um, <clears throat> because he was not afraid to call a spade a spade. Uh, and uh, when he was aware that there was uh, sin in the church, he would take it upon himself to walk up to the person on Sunday morning and say, it has been brought to my attention that you have such and such sin in your life. Please leave the church and do not return. Just like that. Um... You wouldn't get by with that kind of stuff today. But that's how Spurgeon did it. Um, there is uh, an importance of, of the need for two-way tolerance that is extremely significant. A pastor has to be tolerant of the people that he is serving, and the people who are being served have to be very tolerant uh, of him. We have to give each other a lot of wobble room uh, because of our humanity. Um, religion resists that type of thing. 
religion is much more strict and straight-laced. Um, not suggesting that anyone should go out and live a lie or be unaccountable or anything like that, but rather the oil that allows there to be peace and harmony flowing in the mechanism of a local church between congregation and pastor is the oil of grace. Giving room for others to be who they are because the truth is we all have bents. We all have quirks. We all have little idiosyncrasies in things about us that one way or another tick somebody else off. We do. I've told you the story before uh, about the fellow early on that came to see me, made an appointment to come and see me, and just basically sat down and, and uh, he said, I just wanted you to know that I don't like you. I just, I don't like you. I've never liked you. Uh, I don't like the way you talk. Uh, I don't like the way you present. I just don't like anything about you. And I feel real bad about that, but... I feel like I need to tell you and be honest with you and just let you know that I don't like you. Now, if that's not humility and how I obtained it, I don't know what is. <laughs> but hey, he was honest. So, yeah. Um, different personality types. And there are all kinds of personality types, aren't there? Uh, Ryan, if you ever call the psychiatric hotline, if you are obsessive compulsive, please press one repeatedly. <laughs> if you are codependent, please ask someone else to press two. If you have multiple personalities, please press three, four, five, and six. If you are paranoid delusional, we know who you are and what you want. Just stay on the line so we can trace the call. If you are schizophrenic, listen carefully, and a little voice will tell you which number to press. And if you are manic depressive, it doesn't matter what number you press because no one's going to answer. <laughs> a good sense of humor is essential if you're going to survive in ministry. You have to have a good sense of humor. Um, early on in ministry, that was so hard for me. It's still difficult, but I'm better at it, I think, than what I used to be, to have a sense of humor about things. Don't take things so seriously all the time. But there are a number of principles with respect to uh, ministry and uh, serving as an overseer in a church. And the first principle is that the pride of position must be absent. The pride of position must be absent. I find it very interesting that Peter is writing here in verse 1, and he said, I exhort the elders among you, and then he says, as a fellow elder. He doesn't come out and say, I exhort and I command because I am the Apostle Peter. I hold the keys to the church. I, you know, and all this kind of stuff. I am the leader and you will obey me. No, it wasn't that at all. It was not that at all. Um, whatever honor had been his, whatever privileges had been his, uh, he never hints at those things as far as position of authority. Um, we don't find that in his remarks. What we find is someone who says, I'm a fellow elder just like you, and I'm a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and I'm going to be a partaker in the glory that's going to be revealed. And those are humbling words. Humbling words. Uh, nothing about the importance of the letter or his recipients. 
uh, he simply identifies with them. And uh, fellow elder or partner or partaker, I am a partner with you. He sees himself on the same level as all the other elders. Uh, very often in different church groups where you uh, have uh, the government of a local church formed, um, the job description for a pastor uh, oftentimes is written um, one of a plurality of elders, but first among equals. And I get that because somebody has to be in charge. But the emphasis there is not on the first. <laughs> the emphasis is on the equals. Because the first only has to do with function. It doesn't have to do with position. Um, <clears throat> Church work is a very easy place to become proud. It's a very easy place to become proud. Pastors stand before groups of people on a weekly basis, the number of which CEOs of Fortune 500 companies don't stand in front of on a regular basis. And they speak for a lengthy period of time without being interrupted, without being challenged, without being second-guessed. Um, and it's very easy to coast along without being accountable. Um, very rarely are you questioned. And uh, if you are, your answers are very seldom challenged. You work alone for the most part, outside of the public eye, hidden away in your study. Um, and all of that is fine, but it's a minefield of peril and danger because before you know it, if you're not careful, you can fall into the trap of believing that only what we say and only what we discover is important, and it is especially dangerous when your ministry grows and your name grows and your fame grows. And if you don't believe me, just look around at all of the big, well-known ministries throughout even the last decade of where uh, different ones have fallen uh, in ministry because of some kind of sin issue. The Bible says, oh, how the mighty have fallen. So if Peter, here, who is one of the original 12, the earliest spokesman for the church, this one who is the anointed servant of God, if he's not going to mention his role of importance as an apostle, a founding apostle of the church, then there's certainly lessons for us to learn about humility, isn't there? So the pride of position has to be absent. Secondly, the heart of a shepherd must be present. The heart of a shepherd must be present. And this is why he says, shepherd the flock of God, verse 2. Shepherd the flock. To act as a shepherd, to tend a flock, Um, notice whose flock it is. 
God's flock. It's not your flock. It's not my flock. Throughout my ministry, I have tried to intentionally be very, very careful never to refer to any church as my people. My people. My congregation. My church. It's God's people. It's His church. You know, um, they're, they're not controlled by an under-shepherd. They're controlled by God. And ultimately, they have to answer to Him, and they live their lives before Him, and they obey Him. Um, the elder is the shepherd of the flock in which God has placed him. And as such, he is responsible to bear the responsibility for that flock to seek them when they stray, to defend them from harm, to comfort them in pain, and to feed them truth. That's what a shepherd is supposed to do. I remember <clears throat> I remember in one of our classes um, Mr. Brew was our professor. I never had him for pastoral theology, but I think I learned more pastoral theology from him than anybody else. And I distinctly remember one day when he came into class and started class by saying, well, first of all, he opened in prayer, and then he said, gentlemen, if you are not willing to have the heart of a shepherd, please do the Lord Jesus a favor and don't go into the ministry because I'm sick and tired of getting calls from churches of where we've sent young men out and they never should have been there. So if you don't have a shepherd's heart, don't go in to ministry because it's not just book learning. It's not just the exegesis. It's not just the theology. It's not just the public speaking. You have to shepherd a flock. And it's amazing that they didn't teach us more about shepherding. I think they're better at it nowadays. But uh, back in the day, it was all the high, heady stuff. And uh, unless you had some kind of an internship, you didn't get much training when it came to shepherding. So being very, very careful um, to know that, that, that you're called to that. There was a minister of music who had a sign in his office and it said never try to teach a pig to sing it wastes your time and it annoys the pig now what is it really saying hmm? what is it really saying Ken Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you don't teach ducks to climb trees like squirrels. It's not, it's not who they are. You know, everybody's designed differently. Same thing is true when it comes to ministry. I mean, there are wonderful people who are gifted as evangelists. And I have seen people who are evangelists pastor churches and the church is full uh, people are saved and the church is full but they're not pastored and 
I've seen churches where um, you could uh, you you could turn the congregation almost into a seminary classroom because of the depth of teaching that takes place, and uh, they are so smart theologically, but yet they're not being shepherded, not being cared for. It's it's a balancing act, it really is. But if you don't have that gift, uh, boy, oh boy, it can do an awful lot of damage. There are three attitudes that he talks about here that are essential. Um, first of all, uh, an attitude of willingness. An attitude of willingness. Uh, he says, shepherd the flock of God, not under compulsion, but voluntarily. Now, compulsion means to be compelled by force. Uh, you know, um, when you get your teenager out of bed in the morning and tell them it's time to go to school, and you may have to sound that clarion call three or four times in successive pitches of octaves, um, that's compulsion. Um, but that's not what Peter is talking about here. Um, remember, Paul wrote to Timothy, and uh, he said that uh, God's messengers are to be ready in season and out of season, right? Faithful shepherds are to be ready in season and out of season. In other words, when you feel like it and when you don't feel like it. Because I'll be very honest with you, there are days where I don't feel like being a pastor. It's just human nature. As I'm sure, there are days you don't feel like doing the things that you do. Um, when you feel like it and when you don't feel like it. When the church is growing, when the church is not growing. When everything's great, when everything is not great. Stay the course. An attitude of willingness. Um, one of the things that creates um, very quick burnout for young pastors is the fact that they don't have the willingness to stick it out. They just don't. And one of the things that is necessary that too many do not do uh, is... Um, is to make time for yourself. And early on in ministry, I was that person. I didn't make time for me. It's too much to do. Too much to do. And as much as I loved my mentor, um, he didn't know what a day off was and made you feel guilty if you took one. Um, so that's the first attitude the second attitude is an attitude of eagerness uh, look at how Peter expresses it uh, not under compulsion but willingly as God would have you uh, second one right here not for shameful gain but eagerly. Shameful gain. Sordid gain. The old King Jim says, filthy lucre. Filthy lucre. It's like, what on earth is filthy lucre? It's got to be dirty. And what's a lucre? Case in point. You don't go around hanging out your shingle uh, as uh, the area person who will do all the weddings and funerals for 50 bucks a pop just so you can make 50 bucks a pop. That's filthy lucre. You're in it for the money. All right? Well, sad to say, but in most cases, you're going to be sadly mistaken. 
all right? Uh, but unfortunately, uh, there are those, and our wonderful TV evangelist friends are many of which are in it for the money. Um, you're, you're, you're not in it for the perks. Um, be eager to serve. Don't be greedy to serve. Um, enthusiasm is important. And that is contagious. And if you have a leader who is enthusiastic, you'll have a people that are enthusiastic because it catches, it spreads. That's one of the reasons why Peter emphasizes this. Thirdly, uh, he says there needs to be an attitude of meekness. Look at verse 3 again. Not lording it over those who are allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. Peterson says it this way, not bossily telling them what to do, but tenderly showing them the way. Pastors do very well to remember that they are servants, not sovereigns. Um, everybody doesn't work for you. Everybody doesn't come through the door on Sunday morning and kiss the ring. That's not what it's about. Um, there is room for differences of opinion. There is room for disagreement. Uh, there is room for people to have opinions. Um, meekness does not necessarily mean weakness. It doesn't mean that you take the other extreme and you go around like some little weak, malbatosed pastor who can't make a decision. No, that's not it. Um, it's a wonderful thing when you are secure in your position before the Lord to the extent that you can allow people uh, to have differences where that they don't have to walk lockstep to your drum all the time. Um, One of the dangers of being a pastor is that it brings an enormous amount of authority. Enormous. Not even a board of elders or deacons has the authority that a pastor has standing in a pulpit on Sunday morning. Because it is a place where he can wield incredible authority and if he chooses to do so he can pull rank all the more reason not to abuse it pastors are not a stand-in for Jesus some think that they are but we're not The very best thing for a pastor to be able to do is to try to live a life of authenticity and accountability and humility. And those are the things that the Lord will use to bind your heart to the hearts of your people. We're not supposed to lord it over those in our care. When you, when you come to a church where the pastor has to approve everything, where the pastor has to be in charge of everything, where the pastor has to have the final say of everything, you have a very insecure pastor. Extremely insecure. 
extremely insecure. Um, it's, 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 it's sad. Because if you look at Scripture, Jesus didn't even demand that from his people. What Jesus basically said was, don't be afraid. Very rarely did Jesus raise his voice about anything or rebuke his followers because Jesus of all people knew that sheep thrive best when they are led, not driven. And when they are released and not controlled. And when they know that they are loved and not shamed. And then in verse 4, he talks about this eternal reward. It's an unfading crown of glory. And it is an exclusive reward that is reserved for those who faithfully shepherd the flock. Something that we anticipate when we meet the Lord. So there needs to be a healthy balance. We need to make careful that we do not underestimate the importance of nor exaggerate the importance of your role as the shepherd. There's got to be a balance. And at the same time, keep that sense of humor. Take God seriously, but don't take yourself too seriously. And be a reason for rejoicing. Be a reason for rejoicing. Um, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17. When I'm talking about being a reason for rejoicing, um, that too works both ways. Um, it's important for the people uh, to be a reason for the rejoicing of the shepherd. <clears throat> Hebrews 13 and verse 17. Uh, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep... <clears throat> excuse me. For they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable uh, for you. Um, as much as pastors have this great responsibility to shepherd, Sheep have the responsibility of following. And uh, some do it. Some do it not so well. But in doing so, um, do it in such a way that when the pastor goes to the pastor's conferences, you know, where all the bragging takes place, right? Right? Oh, come on, you know that it does. How many do you have on a Sunday morning? What's the size of your missions budget? Blah, 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 blah. Be the congregation where the pastor is able to say, you know what? Here's what I appreciate about my people. You know, I can honestly say um, that, that I have, I have, had the opportunity and taken the opportunity and counted a privilege to be able to brag about this church family. Uh, many times I have said to other people that 
uh, in all of our years of ministry, we have never felt so loved as we have at New Era Bible Church. And um, that we have uh, a church where there is no pretense. What you see is what you get. Um, the, the honesty that is there, the love for one another that is there, the um, bearing with and forgiveness of one another, uh, the lack of judgmentalism uh, that we have seen in other places. I mean, these are wonderful things that I can share and some of the other people that you're sharing with, they just kind of look at you with a blank stare because, oh, they wish they could say the same thing. But unfortunately, they can't. So, anyway, this is the, the standout section of, uh, of chapter 5. Any questions, comments, thoughts? I hate preaching about being a pastor, but sometimes you have to you have to bear it. God knows more. Well, of course He does. Yeah, you bet. And if He's not, you are. That's right. Yep. That, you will. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yep. Yep. I think by the time things got to Spurgeon, all of that had been worked through. Spurgeon, I mean, Spurgeon had a network of lay leaders, a network of, of lay pastors. So I would imagine that by the time, it was kind of like going to the Supreme Court, you know, by the time it went to, the, to, to Spurgeon, you know, it was, here's what we've done. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Spurgeon's, um, Spurgeon's big demise, um, that probably was the thing that actually killed him, uh, was the stress of what was called the downgrade controversy. Um, there was, um, well, what it was, uh, was um, theological compromise um, within the uh, Baptist uh, denomination. And... Um, Spurgeon, uh, Spurgeon had a, a very dynamic and strong uh, voice and following. Um, you know, I mean, you have to understand, in that day, uh, every week, Spurgeon's sermon was published in the newspaper. Every one of them. So if you couldn't be in attendance, you could at least read uh, Spurgeon's message. And... Um, so he had no problem, you know, uh, putting op-eds in the paper and all this kind of stuff. Well, it ended up being uh, the type of thing where people finally uh, ganged up on him and uh, um, set him up and accused him of things that were absolutely false. And the stress uh, of all that uh, sent him physically into a tailspin. He ended up having to uh, go to the south of France for his health, um, and uh, and it was it was there um, six months later that he died. And uh, most folks attribute it to all of the the uh, the stress and the fatigue of that. Yeah. Yep. That's exactly what it was. Mm-hmm. Anything else? 
How about you pray? Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for good, um, gentle reminders from humble servants as far as the importance of um, shepherding and doing so with uh, humility and integrity. Uh, we realize that we are not worthy, uh, but yet uh, your callings and your choosings are of your design. And so help us to remain faithful and uh, give you all that praise and glory in the process. In Jesus' name, amen.